Again, you had some serious feedback going. Yes. That's better. How about this now? Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me all right now? Yes. Can you hear me just with this? A little off. How about now? A little low. A little low as, as soft? Yes. Uh, let's see here. All right, test one, two. What if I... How about now? How about now? Is this better? 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 Oh, you got bad feedback going there. Yeah. 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 Do you know how to adjust your microphone? Well, it's this thing. So it's still soft with this microphone? Oh, we can hear you. Okay. I'm trying to find it in the settings, but all right. Nice, uh, nice sermon yesterday, Pastor. Thank you. Um, it kind of mirrored what Pastor Preby had to say about conciliation. Okay. Are you guys now, you didn't get an assigned graduate, right? Right. Okay. Are you calling from the field again then? We have a call meeting tomorrow night. And I'm hoping what we'll do um, is that we'll, we'll have a look at the people that the president has uh, given us and then, you know, get home for a week and play about it and then come back. Mm-hmm. It's never an easy thing, is it? Because um, then we're going to leave another congregation without a pastor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's just such a small number graduating this year. How many were there this year? I want to say 23 graduates and then another four from previous classes that have been tutoring. But, yeah, it was mid-20s. Not nearly enough. Yeah. You know what a uh, class size is? 
What what? What the size of Vickers class is for next year. I think it's a couple more. It's like 27, something like that. And then the ones that are in their first year at seminary is 40 something. So we've got Oh, to- that's wonderful. Yeah. Forty's a big class. Yeah. There's a couple of those big classes in a row. Put this up. Hi, Faye. Hello. How are you doing today? Doing good. How about you? Doing well. Doing well. Good. Hi, Sonny and Ray. Hi, Pastor. Hi, Faye. Hey, Sonny. Why don't you guys sit next to one another so that the others can space out since you guys are living. That's what we just started. I got a question already for tonight. You got a question? Yes, sir. But, but it has to do with, you know, you know, Bible, you know, uh, Bible information class. I mean, I mean, it's a, it's one that I don't know if anybody else thought of it. <laughs> you know, that, you want me to ask you now, or, or, when, or when it start? When Bible study start? Yeah. Um. Huh? Let's see. Why don't a- ask it now, and then Mordecai. I'll. Uh, I may say I'll. I'll start with that. Hi, Mordecai. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. There you go. Just said I'll forget it. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. There's a mistake. Isn't it? Isn't it gonna be a mistake? Because there's a middle name. You need your middle name in it? No, hers. Uh, hers? Oh. That's a middle name. Okay, what's your middle name? Hers? Yeah. Elsie. E L C E. Okay, so do you need it? You need to say Marie Elsie? Yeah. Middle? Okay. Yeah, I can I can do that again. E L C I E? E L C I E. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so you need to say I was watching. I was watching church services this weekend, and a couple of the church services uh, spoke on the creation. You know, went through the creation as the old gospel reading. Okay. And, uh, and you know, I'm sure we've heard the creation story a million times, or the you know creation. And uh, this is the first time it hit me. Uh, God rested on the seventh day. Well, God doesn't. God doesn't get tired. So, right. If you can answer, you know, why he did that was it for our benefit or, or whatever. But you know, I, I just that just hit me. God didn't get tired, so why did he rest? And yeah. So the the Hebrew word there I'm sorry? refers to uh, to ceasing. So you know, each day he was creating something, and then he stopped that creation of of new things. So he. He ceased, he, he rested from his work of creating because he was done. He set the example. So that, so that, so, um, so the translation then is, is, is wrong then, right? Because he didn't, he didn't rest. He, uh, see, he stopped for the day. Is, is that what you're saying? I wouldn't say that it's wrong. I would say, you know, to, to 
uh, rest from something means that you're not doing it, right? So he, he, he rested and he told us to, to rest on the, you know, he told the people of Israel to rest on the Sabbath day. Um, so I, yeah, I wouldn't say it's, it's wrong, but it has the idea of stopping something that you had been doing. And it's a, it's a great, uh, um, you know, he, he tells us that we, we need to take a break from what we do normally as well. I just took it as actual rest. When, when it said rest, I took it as actual, okay, I'm tired. I'm going to sit down. I, I didn't take it as stopping. You know, I took it as, okay. as actual, he was physically tired and, he's, and, he, and he had to rest. You well, know? yeah, it never, says, it never says he's physically tired because, of course, he right, wasn't. Right, 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 right. Right. Yeah, no, no, no. yeah. I just interpret rest as being, sure. okay, I'm physically tired from what I'm doing today and I've got to rest. Sure. Yeah, we, we do things a whole lot differently than God does, don't we? Right, right, right. right. Yeah. That, that's, that's what threw me, but I didn't interpret yeah. it as, as you know, like stopping or you know, ceasing. or I didn't take it as that. Okay, okay. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. I'm going to get something out of the printer from our account. Man, if all the questions could be that easy. <laughs> oh, I think I've had some tougher ones than that, but not today. <laughs> you, you go, girl. At least not so far, right? We <laughs> <laughs> had a good day. Yeah, it was long. Mom, it was a long one. Well, this right part of the time, you put a fold in it, but. Yeah, okay. Okay. Thank you. Did I get it right? All right, excellent. All right, welcome, everybody. It is 7 o'clock. Let's start with prayer. Lord God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to gather around your word tonight. Bless us that through our study of your word, we grow in our understanding of how amazing your love is for us. What you've done for us is, is uh, beyond description. So we thank you, we praise you, and we ask that you build our relationship with you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, Car Carlo will join us in a minute. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, good. So, uh, any questions as we start? Uh, Sonny kind of gave us a preview one, which is a great question about about God resting on the seventh day. Uh, any any other questions that you had? Nope. All right. All right, well then, we will get into chapter four. In uh, lesson three, we looked at uh, Christ's two natures, divine and human. We looked at uh, uh, his two stages or states, his humiliation and exaltation when he reclaimed the full use of his divine power, um, all that he did for our salvation. And so we talked about how, how Jesus died to pay for the sins of all the world, um, that Every person who has ever lived, who has ever sinned, that sin was paid for by the blood of Jesus. But we also said that not everybody goes to heaven uh, because there are those that, that reject that, that uh, want to try their own way, and, and that way doesn't work because none of us can be good enough. None of us can be perfect. Uh, we need the perfection that Jesus won for us. We need him to pay for our sins. And so in chapter 4 now, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how that works, how someone gets faith, how they come to faith. Um, the, uh, the, the title of chapter four there is the Holy Spirit. Um, we looked at God the Father. In lesson three, we looked at God the Son. Uh, and now we have the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. Not third in like, you know, inferior or something, but uh, those are the, the ways in which they're named, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You've got that picture, uh, that diagram on the top of the page again there, just reminding us you know, of this Trinity. If you watch service on Sunday, you saw Trinity Sunday. Um, so you know the Father is 100% God. The Son is 100% God. The Spirit is 100% God, but the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. Um, one plus one plus one equals 
one. So this this mind blowing trinity. Uh, and just like we did with the others, uh, we, we start by looking at who the Holy Spirit is. The third person of the Trinity, Holy Spirit's true God, um, a person of the triune God. You've got that passage from 2 Corinthians again, where all three are named. Uh, he's fully equal with the Father and the Son. In Acts 5, the, that passage there has um, Peter talking to Ananias. Um, maybe a little background there. The early Christian church, they took care of of their own. They took care of people who needed help. Um, They were very generous. Uh, We read about a guy named Joseph who sold a piece of land that he had, and he he gave all the money that he made from it to the disciples and said, here, use this to help the poor, and they did. And there must have been a great reaction. People must have said, oh, how wonderful this is that they did that, because then we hear about Ananias and Sapphira, this couple, that they have a piece of land. They sell it. Uh, They keep some of the money for themselves. And they give the rest of it to the disciples and say, this is everything we made from the land. Now, they didn't have to give any of it. Uh, They could have kept all of it for themselves. They didn't have to sell a piece of land. The issue was they said they gave it all, but they didn't. And so this is Peter calling Ananias on the carpet for this. Um, And notice how he talks about the Holy Spirit when he talks about this. So uh, Acts 5, 3 to 4. Uh, Jordan, you want to play or pass? Uh, play. Okay, you got to be nice and loud because uh, the speaker's all the way over here. Okay. All right. Uh, then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied, lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. Yeah, notice he said you lied to the Holy Spirit. And then later in the passage, he says you lied to God. Holy Spirit is God. And we could look at all sorts of other passages, but we kind of did the same thing with the Father and the Son. So I figure um, if we can agree, yeah, the Holy Spirit's one of the three persons of the Trinity. True God, the Bible is really clear about that. The rest of the lesson deals with what he does. Um, he and he was a little more than called out. What's that? So he was a little more than called out. Ananias? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that might have been an understatement that Peter <laughs> called him out. Um, and the Holy Spirit made him pay a price. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> Again, demonstrating uh, how, how serious it is to deal with a, a holy God um, and how amazing it is that God doesn't zap all of us uh, like that. I mean, yeah, it wasn't good for Ananias and Sapphira to lie, but who of us can say we haven't done something just as bad? Um, God could say that's it. But instead, he punished his son. Uh, he, he punished his son and, and says whoever believes in him lives and doesn't get, get uh, instantly punished for sin. Um, instead, now, we get eternal life. Now, why do you think he did it in this case? Because Jesus was already dead and risen by that point. Okay. So Greg just asked the question, uh, why did he do this in this case? So the question is, why did God do something? The first answer is because he loves us. So now how is this, how is this showing love? Um, it, there are times in Scripture where God makes an example of something. Um, I think of some of the some of the victories that he gave to the people of Israel. You know, like like with Gideon. Um, if you don't know that story, look it up. But uh, uh, they've got thirty thousand troops. God says, "No, nope, too many. Send them home." Uh, they get down to ten thousand. No, nope, too many. Send them home. Uh, they get down to three hundred against uh, one hundred fifty thousand. Uh, and God says, "Okay, now now you can see who's really doing this. I didn't want you to think that you accomplished this. I wanted you to see who's really so." So normally that's not how God had the people of Israel fight. But in this case, he said, I'm making an example. Uh, There was that time when uh, some teens were making fun of the prophet. um, And there have been a lot of times when prophets or pastors or teachers have been made fun of by kids. Uh, Normally, nothing happens other than what, you know, maybe the the parents punish them. But in this case, uh, God sent some bears to eat the children who were making fun of the prophet. 
and, and said, this, this will teach you not to do that. Um, so he's got the power to do that, but he set an example. He said, hey, you should take that seriously. Uh, and so here, when we're talking, talking to God, take it seriously. Uh, and so by taking it out on Ananias and Sapphira like that, we have this lesson. I, I think of uh, in 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about the, the people of Israel and the way that they um, had gone through, you know, they, they would complain and grumble and then God would send, send this destruction on them and they'd pray and God would send a rescue. And then they, and Paul's talking about that, that, uh, that cycle. And he says, all of this happened to them as examples for us who are in the same situation where we need to be trusting God's promises. So you see how God dealt with them. It's, it's the same reality for us. He wants us to learn from their examples. Um, so why did he let it happen there? Because he, he wanted us to see it um, so that we could say, you know what, I, I want to be, I want to be uh, awe struck or awe filled when I'm de dealing with God. Um, yeah. And pastor, we see the correction rod here in the Ananias story, don't we? Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it is not a punishing rod. It's a correction rod. <laughs> he corrected him, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. So, good. Okay, so we've got the Holy Spirit is God. Um, now, what does the Holy Spirit do? And in order to understand what the Holy Spirit does, um, we have to understand what he's working with, right? Because normally we talk about God the Father. The, the main work attributed to him is creator, right? We talk about God the Son, the main work attributed to him is redeemer, right? He paid for our sins. And now we talk about God the Holy Spirit, and the main work attributed to him is sanctifier. He, he makes holy, and he keeps holy. Uh, so how does he make me holy? Because I'm not holy, but he makes me holy by putting Jesus' perfection on me and taking my sins and, and, and giving that to Jesus. He makes me holy by working faith in my heart, like we looked at in lesson two. You know, we're, we're justified, declared not guilty, that righteousness is, is made ours. And the first part, the, 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 these next verses here, make us realize how big a deal that is. Um, so what does the Holy Spirit do? He sees the condition in which we work. I think a lot of people think um, they diminish the work of the Holy Spirit because, well, who's not going to come to faith, right? It only makes sense to believe. Or I was pretty much there, you know, I, I chose to believe in God. But uh, when you look at what the Bible says about what we are by nature and what the Holy Spirit's working with, uh, he, the gift of faith is, is absolutely a miracle. Because by nature, we're born sinful, right? Uh, Adam and Eve sinned, and they handed it down to us. And now we're born in sin, and we continue to sin, and we give in to that sin. Um, and so... And that's a big deal. It's not like, oh, everybody's sinful, so it's no big deal. No, it is a big deal because God says, be perfect, be holy. Um, but when God looks at us by nature, without him working on us, what does he see? He sees that I'm dead. Uh, Ephesians 2, 1, Nolan. As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. Okay. Uh, so you, you, you think about that, uh, and he goes on in, in Ephesians 2 there talking about what that looked like uh, when we're, we're doing just what our desires want to do, what the world wants us to do, um, and disturbing God's wrath. So we were dead. So you think about that picture. He uses the, the picture of a dead body, a corpse. What can a dead body do? Nothing. Yeah, nothing, right? Um, if you're watching... My wife was trained in the medical field, and, and so when we started dating, uh, ER was the big, the big show, and we had to watch the medical show, and then after that, we got another one. And um, So if you watch any of those, those TV dramas, medical shows, and, and you see uh, the guy on the, on the gurney, and the, the, he's all hooked up, and it, it goes flatline, right? Uh, and you hear the beep. If all of a sudden that, you see that guy sit up, grab the paddles, uh, tell the guy, you know, set it to 200, put it on himself, yell clear, and, and uh, shock himself back to life, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're not going to be watching that show much more. That, that's just not realistic. Uh, if someone is dead, 
someone else has to do something. Something else has to act to change that because a dead body can't change it for itself. Um, it does, I'm leaving. Right, right. And, and, and that's the picture that he uses. He says, we were dead. So what can a corpse do? Nothing. Spiritually, what could we do to, to become alive? We couldn't. Something, something else had to make me alive, right? Um, the Bible also says by nature we were hostile to God. Mordecai, do you want to play or pass on uh, Romans 8, 7? I mean, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Okay. Um, it, it says, I don't want to listen to God. It says, it says, I'm hostile. I'm fighting against instead of coming toward. So, so even if I could do something, which I can't because I'm dead, I wouldn't want to. I'd be fighting against him instead of coming towards him. So dead, hostile. The Bible says, by nature, we think God's word is foolish. Greg, you read 1 Corinthians 2? The man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Okay. So what, what does the spirit use? What, what changes someone? Well, it's the word, right? But by nature, we say, that's dumb. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, that, that God would, would do it for me instead of me earning it. Of course, I got to earn it. Uh, that's what my natural man says. But so if, well, I'll put it this way. If uh, my kids came up to me, and said, hey, Dad, you got to transfer all your money to this, this website uh, because the Teletubbies are going to take over the world, and, and we want to be on their side so that when they take over the world, we can have our own island. Um, and do you think I'm going to put money, I'm going to transfer money into that, you know, to that website? Am I going to send my money out of my bank account? No. Uh, I might play along with them, but there's no way I'm doing it because that's foolish. He says that's what we think of God's word on our own by nature. Unless our heart is changed, our heart says, no, I don't want anything to do with it. That's crazy. So he calls us dead, hostile. We think God's word is foolish. And look at Genesis 6. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart, only evil all the time. By nature, the only choice we make is which sin we're going to pursue. We can't say, I want to pursue God, uh, not for the right reasons, not in the right way. Um, by nature, we are dead, hostile, think his word is foolish. Make sense? Might sound like I'm beating a dead horse, but there are hundreds more passages that say very much the, the same thing because we really need to hear it. Because it's, it's way too easy for us to say, well, I'm not that bad. Um, I was pretty much there already, and you know, maybe the Holy Spirit helped me a little bit, but no, no, no. I was dead, he made me alive. I was blind, he made me see. And that, that's what all the, all the next passages uh, are going to talk about. And, and we start with the passage about conversion. You know, the Holy Spirit calls me to faith through the word. And we have the example of Saul there. Uh, Saul slash Paul, uh, once he became Christian, uh, he started to become known as this missionary. He started to become known as, as Paul, um, changed his name. Uh, because of the huge change that happened to him. And this, in Acts 26 here, we have Paul towards the end of his life. Uh, he's on trial, and he tells his story to help the judge, he's in front of the king, uh, King Agrippa right here, uh, help him understand what's really going on. Because he's being accused of um, rebelling against God, of rebelling against the faith, of... Uh, um, trying to, to bring disruption into the nation with these crazy religious ideas. And so look at how he, uh, how he starts. So the, the Jews are bringing him to trial, um, saying that he is fighting against God. And Paul says, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So he says, at one time, guys, I was exactly like you. I was doing everything to stop people from talking about Jesus. He says, and that's just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Um, we read when Stephen, the first Christian martyr, was put to death, we read that, that Saul was there watching the garments. He was supporting the whole thing. Verse 11, many a time 
I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. So I didn't just, I didn't just feel this way. I acted on it. I tried to force them to blaspheme. To, to blaspheme means to say that God isn't God, right? So in other words, he was trying to get him to say Jesus isn't God when the reality is he is, which makes it blasphemy. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. So he's going on the road to try to get Christians wherever he can. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. The goads were the sharp things that would get an animal to go the direction you wanted it to go. Um, he says, you're, you're going the wrong way here. This, this is going to end poorly. Um, and so Saul asked, who are you? You know, who is this speaking to me? You're clearly over me, right? He calls him Lord. You know, you're clearly a power over me. <coughs> who are you? And now imagine hearing this. Your whole life has been spent trying to get rid of people who are talking about this crazy thing, Jesus, you know, Jesus, he's dead, he's worthless. And then he, here's this bright light and all this power and Paul's on his knees and he says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that felt like? Um, Not in a million years. What's that? Not in a million years. Right. So he says, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So Paul's on the way to Damascus in order to kill Christians, in order to get rid of Christianity. Jesus appears and says, no, no, no. Oh, 180 degrees. We're still sending you to Damascus, but now you're going to be a messenger. You're going to be telling people about me. Um, so just play this through step by step. Notice Paul's attitude toward Christianity prior to his conversion, as hostile to Christianity as you can be. God appears in a bright light. God renders him powerless. And now you've got a really tough question here. Which statement is more accurate? A, Paul willingly chose to become a Christian, or B, Although Paul was unwilling, God brought him to faith. He wasn't, he wasn't willing at the time that he was dropped to his knees. He was not at all willing, right? Paul was unwilling. Paul said, I do not want to be a Christian. I want to kill Christians. And God says, nope, you're going to believe now. Um, who did that? You know, can anyone... The Holy Spirit. Say, exactly. Can, can anyone say... Saul just finally got smart. Oh, oh. He, he, he decided, you know what? I've had enough of persecuting Christians. No. Um, God changed his heart. And the reason I put this example on here is because when someone comes to faith, that's an internal thing, right? It's, it's a heart thing. I can't see your heart when I use it like that. I mean, if you can see the physical heart, but you know what I'm talking about. I, I can't see what's going on in your heart. Um, I can see the, the results of what's going on in your heart. But I, unless you tell me, I don't know what you're thinking. Um, and so we don't, we don't choose to become Christians. God chooses us. I thought, right. I thought, I thought God chose, I mean, that on the cross for everybody. So, but he's still choosing who are going to be believers and who aren't. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so we'll, um, that, that, uh, I think, <laughs> I think there's a question coming here that, uh, that is actually in this book. Um, and, and so let's, let's go through these couple passages where God explains exactly what he does. Right? Oh, yes, because, um, yeah, yeah because, because by nature, we say no. We're right there with Saul saying, no, I don't want to believe any of this. And God changes us. And I put Saul in here because you can actually see it. And the Holy Spirit tells us exactly what happened. He changed his heart. Um, and that's how he works when you look at all the other passages, too, even when it's invisible, even when it's going on inside my heart. So, so we were dead. How does that change? God brings us from death to life. Uh, Greg, did you just read? I did. Okay, Faye, it's your turn. You want uh, Ephesians 2, 4, and 5? Sure. 
But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace you have been saved. Okay. So we were dead. He made us alive because of his mercy. Mercy is that love that says, oh, you really need some help. And so I want to help you. It's not, oh, you're pretty good. So I'm going to be nice to you. Um, yeah. <laughs> His mercy, God made us alive. We were dead. He brought us to life. Uh, and that's a gift of God. The, the, a couple verses later, um, let's see. Ray, your turn if you want it. Ephesians 2.8. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Okay. Yeah, faith, not what we do, but it's a gift. Um, and faith comes from hearing the word. The, the Holy Spirit uses God's word to work faith in our hearts. Uh, Audrey, you want uh, Romans ten seventeen? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Okay. That's how faith comes, through the word. The Holy Spirit uses that to change hearts. Romans 1, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it, the gospel, the good news, the word, is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. And, and using the word, it's the Holy Spirit doing the work. The Bible is really clear about that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Carl, you want that one? Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So if someone is saying, I hate Jesus, God's word says, he's not a believer. The Holy Spirit isn't, isn't there. Um, and if someone says, Jesus is Lord, he says, there's only one way that someone can believe in Jesus. It's because the Holy Spirit worked in their heart. And 1 Corinthians 1, it's because of him that you're in Christ Jesus, because of what he did, not because of what we do. That's why we're in Jesus. That's why we believe. Uh, so any question there? Um, when you look at how the Bible says it comes to faith, who gets the credit? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Yep. God does. God does it. Um, and, and so not only does he bring us to faith, but then, once he's brought us to faith, he continues to strengthen us in the faith using those same tools, the, the, the word and sacraments, which, which are really the word connected with, with water and bread and wine. So uh, that, that's what the, the next few verses are talking about. The Holy Spirit sanctifies me or sets me apart, makes me holy. That's what that word means. For a life of godly living through the gospel. Uh, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus prayed this about us. Uh, asking God to do this for us. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Carl, is, or you just read. Uh, Carla. Okay, this one? First Corinthians? Uh, John 17, 17. Okay. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. Okay. Um, you know, use the truth. Use your word to continue to make us holy. So he, he declares us holy, and then he helps us to act like that more and more. Um, John 15 is kind of a theme verse at Abiding Grace. You know, we've got the, the vine and branches and our logo and everything. So, uh, you know, he said, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We need to be connected to Jesus. Um, that's, uh, that's how we're built up to live sanctified lives. <laughs> um, so the Holy Spirit sanctifies me for a life of producing good works done in faith. Hebrews 11 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So those good works only come because he has first changed our heart. You know, we love because he first loved us. Um, he sets me apart for a life of producing good works done according to God's will. Uh, Kurt, you want to read Matthew 15, 9, where he's talking about the, the Pharisees who had all their lists of great things that they would do. You know, they wore the right clothes. They gave the right offerings. They... Uh, you know, fasted. They did all of these things. They had the uh, boxes on their heads. Yep, yep, yep. 
They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Yeah. Jesus says, I can tell them to do that. Um, but they're doing these things, uh, claiming they're worshiping me, but, but it's not. So the Holy Spirit strengthens us to do good works, not for our glory or our credit, but according to God's will. Not what I think would be good, but what God says would be good. Um, Ephesians 2, this is, we, we've read several passages from this chapter already. We had verse 1, we were dead. We had verse 4, he made us alive. We had uh, 7 and 8, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, not from yourselves, gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. And then you get verse 10. Uh, Sonny, do you want to read that one? Ephesians 2.10, is that the one you want yeah. me to read? Yes. Wait, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Yeah. So he, the good things that we do are even a gift from God, that he gave us the opportunity to do them. Um, who hasn't felt the, uh, that really cool feeling of, of purpose fulfilled when, when you're able to help someone? And, and you, you didn't go out to, to try to do some good deed, but you, you, you were there and you helped someone and wow, that's really cool. That's a gift from God. He put me in the place. He gave me that opportunity. Um, yeah. So the Holy Spirit sets us apart for a life of producing good works done according to God's will, uh, for a life of producing good works done to God's glory. Uh, Jeff and Karen, you want to read, when you want to read uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31? You're on mute, and I can't see you, so I don't know if, if you're hearing me or not. We'll move on to Jordan then. Jordan, you want that one? All right. Uh, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Okay. Yeah, all for the glory of God. Um, that uh, not so that everybody gives me glory for doing it, but for God. And the Holy Spirit sets us apart for a life of fighting our sinful flesh. I see the Lamberts off of mute now. Do you guys want Hebrews 3.12? Yeah, I can do it. Excellent. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Okay. Uh, so living in this world with a whole lot of temptations, um, God tells us, don't turn away. Uh, don't turn away from the living God. Uh, Hebrews 10.26 uh, Jordan, you just read Nolan. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is allowed. Think about that. That's kind of a scary passage, isn't it? Um, you know, he says if we, but, but we, we always want to notice what he says and, and what he doesn't say. He doesn't say if we sin after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there's no sacrifice for sins left, right? Um, because we are sinners and we, um, we have that battle going on, you know, the, the Romans 7, what I want to do, I don't always do, and what I don't want to do, sometimes I do that because there's that sinful nature fighting with the, the Holy Spirit living in me. Um, but notice what he says. He says, if we deliberately keep on sinning, so, so if I know it's wrong and I go ahead and do it. And, and there are probably some times where that happens too, right? I know something's wrong and I probably shouldn't do it, but I end up doing it out of weakness. Uh, and, and then, oh no, what did I do? Lord, why did I do that? Lord, forgive me. And what happens? The Lord forgives me, right? Um, and Lord strengthened me so I don't do that again. But then maybe that temptation comes up again and, and that's my weakness and I fall for it. And, and I, even though I know it's wrong, I do it. Uh, and, and then, oh no, what did I do? Lord, forgive me. And he forgives me, right? Um, but the more I say, you know what, I don't care what he says, I'm going to do it, the more I'm not going to care what he says, and I'm not going to be asking for that forgiveness. Um, and, and that's when I get into trouble. So he says, if we deliberately keep on sinning, if we continue in those willful sins, um, there's no sacrifice for sins. We walk away from the gift that God has given us. Um, that, that sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Um, and instead, in verse 27, it talks about, but only that fearful expectation of judgment um, for, the, for the, you know, with the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Um, 
are you, are you saying that um, it's not deliberately sinning that has no sacrifice? It's what comes after deliberately sinning? It's <clears throat> so what I'm focusing on is it's not just sin, it's not just deliberate sin, but it's continuing to continue right. to right. deliberately sin. Right. So like there's probably been a time when you knew something was wrong and you, you did it anyway, right? Um, has Jesus forgiven you for that? No. Absolutely, right? Jesus died to pay for that sin. Um, but if you get in the habit of saying, you know what, I'm going to do that again. I don't care what God says. Uh, the more we don't care what God says, the less we care what God says. And so if, if I go ahead and do it, um, I'm hardening my conscience, Right, you know, has that ever happened where, where something you did the first time, uh, it really, really bothered you, but then the next time it was a little bit easier, and the next time it was a little bit easier, and 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 suddenly that beautiful gift of a conscience isn't doing much for you because you you've hardened it. That kind of goes along with this picture, right? If I continue to say, I don't care what you want, God, I'm going to do what I want. Um, eventually, I'm walking away from from the faith. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Did I get your question? That sounds that sounds like an intentional sin. That sounds what? It, it sounds like an intentional sin. But we are we are weak people, uh, yep. and you know we we have weaknesses and we have habits that we have really hard times getting rid of, and those are not intentional sins. They uh, they're sins of the flesh, and uh, you know and by God's grace we can go to the cross and say I'm sorry. Right. Absolutely. And, and Lord, give me strength not to do it again, because I know the more I do that, the further I am away from you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. So any questions on what we've talked about so far? I have one. Okay. Let's say an unmarried couple lives as a married couple, which we would consider sin. Right? Okay. And they have, well, the only way they're going to rectify it is when they get married a year or two out. Okay. And they even joke about they'll possibly go to hell if they were to die now. Okay. Because they're living in the sin. Does, is that when they got married, did they repent of that sin at that time or did they just change what they knew okay. was a sin back to something that wasn't a sin? Okay. Did everybody hear that question? Yeah. Okay. I see a couple of heads shaking. No. Um, so he said, uh, let's say there's, there's a, an unmarried couple who's intending to get married in a couple of years, but they're living together as, as married. They're living in sin, um, acting as if they're married when they're not. Uh, and and they even joke about the fact that they better not die before their wedding because then you know they'd be uh, dying in sin and, and going to hell. Um, so what's what's the situation there? Does marrying fix it? Um, so maybe maybe that's a good. Well, I'll open it up. What do you, what do you guys think? No, you don't fix it until you actually acknowledge it and ask for forgiveness. Okay, that's when you fix it. So it's a matter, it's a matter of repentance. It's a matter of the heart. Right. Um, any sin, whether it's, you know, Kurt, you were talking about some of those sins of weakness, right? Maybe, maybe the a big or little addictions, you know, the things that we, we don't take control of in our lives. And Satan attacks everybody in a different place on that, right? So, <clears throat> so whether it is that, uh, you know, the, the sin of drinking too much or the, the sin of, of uh, uh, harming your body in some other way or, or uh, sex outside of marriage or, or whatever it is, um, it's, it's sin. And the more we do it, the, the more we get ingrained in that. Um, and we need forgiveness for it. How do we get forgiveness for it? Well, because Jesus died for my sins. That, that's how the forgiveness is. And trusting in, in that forgiveness, um, which means I realize that it's a sin. You know, we talked about, we talked about confession, uh, having, you know, the, or, or repentance, having those, those three parts as you turn around. One is the realization, this is a sin and God hates it and it messes with my relationship with God. And then 
I know the, the realization that Jesus died to pay for that sin. He has forgiven me. And then I don't want to do that sin anymore. I want to go the other way. So if, if I'm repentant, all three of those things are happening. If I really realize that it's wrong, and I realize that Jesus died for that sin, I'm not going to want to do that anymore because why would I want to put Jesus to death all over again? Why would I, why would I want to uh, cause that if I realize what he's doing for me? Uh, so repentance involves uh, turning away from that sin. Um, and so now the, the question, so they've been living together, uh, and then when they get married, they're not actively sinning anymore by living together outside of marriage, right? Um, does that mean that everything is fine before? Well, that depends on whether they've repented of that. Um, right. If you've got a rubber raft and you drive across a stick and you puncture a hole in it, if you take it off the stick, it's still got a hole in it. And that hole's going to be there till you fix it, till you right. patch it, till you right. repair it. You're still going to have that hole. So every time you put air in it, it's going to come right back out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, Greg, the, the, the example that, that you gave, um, sadly, in our day and age, that happens a lot. Yeah, and that's a true example I heard today. So. Yeah. And, and, and different people deal with it in different ways. You know, I've, um, I've actually I, I've married several people who have several couples who had been living together. And, and in the course of the premarriage counseling, we'll go through that. Uh, okay, what does God expect of marriage and where is sex to be and, and all of that? Um, and then we'll say, okay, so how are we going to deal with this? Um, and sometimes the answer is, well, you, you move out until the wedding day. Uh, sometimes the, the answer is, um, well, you, you stay in separate rooms and we move up the wedding day. Uh, sometimes the answer, you know, um, like th there was one example where, you know, the wedding was going to be a year out uh, and then we talked about this, and they realized, oh, this is a problem. And then they got married in two weeks and then had a big celebration months later. Um, but it's it's a, a battle. You know, like Kirk talked about, there are certain sins that we get used to, and we find ways to, to excuse and say, well, they're not that bad. And so it's really hard to take some of those drastic actions um, to say, all right, uh, we are we are going to separate until – we do this the right way. Um, and, and to Ray's point, it only is fixed, not when I do the right thing. So if, if, uh, if I, and God forbid it'll never happen, my wife's way too good for me, uh, if I would cheat on my wife um, and, and say, okay, I'm, I'm uh, boy, I enjoyed that, I'm gonna do that again, and I'm gonna do that again. And then uh, the next day I say, well, I'm not having an affair right now, uh, so we should be all good, right? Um, yeah, I don't think that'll work, right? Uh, you know, and why would I do that with God then? To say, God, I'm going to act like I hate you, I'm going to act like I hate you, I'm going to act like I hate you, but then I'll go to church. Um, I need to deal with that, that repentant issue, right? Now, I'm not saying don't go to church, because that's where I'm going to hear God's word saying repent, uh, and hear his word saying here's the forgiveness. Um, I talked a lot. Did I answer the questions? Yeah, you answered. That. Okay. Very well. Oh yeah. All right. All right, can I Good. You know what? You said something a while ago. So What's that? I, I thought that you shouldn't live in the same home with the opposite sex if you weren't married. No matter if you were a girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. I thought it was just, you know, it wasn't proper to live in the same home uh, just as friends if you were the opposite sex. Can you do that? Yeah. So, okay, so uh, I, I think I'm understanding the question. Uh, so the issue is the Bible says the marriage bed is to be kept pure, um, absolutely pure, which means sex is only for husband and wife, not for people who are about to be husband and wife, not for people who are wondering whether they should become husband and wife, not for people who just want to have a good time. Sex is only for husband and wife um, and anything other than that is sin. Now, if I'm doing something that is proclaiming to my neighbors uh, that I'm probably breaking that commandment, um, why would I want to do that, right? So, so it, we, we never want to make hard and fast laws because maybe there's a situation where there are two roommates that are, are absolutely not, um, I mean, 
I, I'm not going to make any hard and fast laws, but I will say, um, well, I'll guarantee you that uh, my kids are, are not going to be uh, allowed to <laughs> move in with, with uh, someone of the opposite sex. Uh, I've heard of situations where, you know, in college, there's three guys and three girls renting an apartment. And, and uh, I, I can't say that's absolutely sin. I can say it's pretty stupid. But uh, um, yeah, uh, but it certainly certainly would lead to a whole lot of temptations. Yeah. Um, so we, you know, to your point, Sonny, we don't want to do anything that's going to either lead us into temptation or give an impression that we're sinning. Right. Um, because, you know, it says you have to, just because you're not sinning, you still have to we'll look out for your neighbor to show them that you're not sinning. In other words, yep. you, know, you don't want you know you you want to bring them to Christ. So you don't want to have any type of illusion that right. you're sinning. You right. Know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Pastor Sharp. Yes. Uh, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, so, per Bible, what is marriage like? What are you supposed to do? Is it like how we do it, or do we just do it in a certain way? where it is like it is like did they used to have to put the ring oh okay yeah good question <clears throat> so <clears throat> and actually chapter 10 is all about this it is going to be talking about what is the essence of marriage so i'll i'll give you the quick answer now and then okay. stay tuned for chapter 10 and we'll get all sorts of passages to back up what i'm about to say okay well, that so let's come back exactly exactly <laughs> so the essence of marriage is commitment it's, it's a man and a woman saying, I will love you till death do us part. I will do the hard things. I will sacrifice. I will forsake all others. I will not uh, break these promises. Uh, they're, they're, it's, it's making that promise. And different cultures have made that promise in different ways. You, know, you mentioned the ring. Yeah, there are some, some places where it's a tattoo. Uh, other places where, um, you know, at different times, it was uh, um, you move in, and that was marriage according to the according to that culture. Like for the the you know Israelites, uh, we don't know of them having any rings involved in their ceremonies. But what they would do is they would have a big party where the the bridegroom would come and and take the bride from the uh, from the her parents' house. And, and they would go back and have a big celebration and, and there would be the, uh, the attendants that would go with on this journey. And, and even without, um, by doing those actions, they were making promises, uh, if, if that makes sense. Um, and different cultures do that in different ways. Uh, you know, a, a, a marriage in Nigeria, uh, you know, in certain areas, you know, in certain of the, of the sections, um, it, it could be once the dowry is paid, uh, once the bride price is paid, uh, they are officially married. Until that time, uh, she has to stay with dad, um, even though they're, uh, they're trying to develop, you know, and so it, each culture, though, determines what is marriage. And, and for us, we are living in a society where we have elected governing officials and put in writing, this is what marriage is. You have to go and get this certificate. You have to uh, verbally speak promises, and then you have to sign. Um, that makes a legal marriage uh, in our, because we're living in the United States, and that's what the law says. Does that answer your question, Preston? Yeah, I did. Okay, good. God, so, um, what is marriage exactly? In the Bible, what was the original, like, what, what constitutes marriage? Let's, can, can we hold that to chapter 10? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, let's hold that to chapter 10. Otherwise, we might go <laughs> down too much of a, of a rabbit hole here tonight. Um, so, yes, we would. Okay, okay so I've got, I've got some questions for you guys uh, on the bottom of page 23 there. First one, can faith be lost? Can faith be lost? Yep. Faith can be lost. Your salvation cannot. Ouch. What, what do you mean? What's the distinction there? You can lose faith in something. You can get disheartened. You can get disillusioned. You can start having a lot of questions. You can even question what you actually believe. But if you've truly 
asked Jesus into your heart, giving your heart to him, what he's claimed, he's claimed. And a lot like the prodigal son, you might lose it. You'll come back to it because that's where, because Jesus has already claimed you. Okay. So, so on the one hand, has Jesus paid for my sins? Absolutely. Has he given me that gift of, of eternal life through a relationship with him? Yes, because I say Jesus is Lord, so I have those things. Would it be possible for me to turn away from that and say, I don't want that anymore? I believe you can. Not if you've truly accepted. So it's, oh, it's uh, how do question. I know if I've truly accepted? Because you won't want to do that. Okay. I mean, you just won't have that deep desire. Like I was saying, you can lose your faith as far as being disillusioned or what have you. But as far as that deep down, I don't want that anymore. You won't have that if you ever truly had it. Okay. All right. I, I, I want to be cautious in how we phrase things. Um, if I ever truly had it, I think that that could lead me to question, well, do I truly have it? Is it? Uh, I, wa I want to always put the, the work on God. Because only God can do this work, right? Um, yeah. And so I, I, think, I think I know where you're coming from on this. Uh, so we'll start with, what does the Bible say about the possibility of someone losing faith? Um, I mean, we, we saw those two passages from Hebrews. You know, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there's no sacrifice for sins left. So, um, so I'm a believer, and then I go more and more towards the sin, Eventually, I'm walking all the way away. Uh, Hebrews 3, he's talking to brothers, believers. Uh, See to it that you, no one, none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Uh, I, I think of Judas. You know, Jesus called him a disciple. He gave him responsibility, uh, and then he went to the place he deserved because he rejected that forgiveness that Jesus was winning for him. Or, or King Saul, uh, who, who was a... a God chose him as, as the first king of Israel, and he was faithful and, and a believer, and then he got proud and turned away from God and uh, ended up not in heaven. Um, so, so there are now, but, but then we get, get to that, that conflict there, but, but what about these promises that God has made? You know, Jesus says, uh, no one can pluck them out of my hand, right? He, he, he's got us in his hand. No one can pluck them out of his hand. But notice he doesn't say, and he facts he in fact he warns us not to jump out of his hand. He doesn't force us to stay. He gives us all the tools and all the ability, you know, all everything we need to stay. And and I think Ray, you made you know, you said I'm not if I'm if I'm growing closer to God, I'm not gonna wanna do go the other way. Um, but if if I'm a believer that's not growing closer, but I'm going the other way, because there's a constant battle, right? The world is constantly trying to, to lead me away. Satan's constantly trying to trick me. Um, and I'm, I'm going one way or the other. I'm growing one way or the other, either towards God or away from him. Um, God does not force me to stay. He says, remain in me, and I'll remain in you. Right. Stay in my word, and, and you'll be fine. Uh, but if you keep making decisions to go the other way, if you deliberately keep on sinning, you're turning away. So I don't think that we can say that meant that I didn't believe in the first place. Um, you know, what does the Bible say? The Bible says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Um, so when my time comes, am I trusting in Jesus or am I trusting in myself? Um, and so can faith be lost? Yes. Uh, you know, there, there's that teaching out there, once saved, always saved, right? Once you, once you claim Christ, uh, you're, you're never going to be lost. Well, the Bible warns, actually, that you can be. Uh, he tells us not to turn away from him. He tells us to, to stay in his word, to keep growing. Um, so, uh, and, and I think, I said, I think I know where you're coming from. That'll be two questions from here. So uh, we're going to take the next one. Is church attendance important? No. Okay, I got a yes and a no. You guys arm wrestle it out here. Yes. What? Okay. Why do you say yes? 
Because you hear the word. Okay. At church, you're going to hear the word. And the Holy Spirit works the word. I got a no out there. Ray, why'd you say no? How many times was Jesus in church? Right. Pretty often. Um, just after whatever. His, after hear, his, child, after his childhood. Synagogue. What's that? After his childhood. He did all of his work and he did all of his teachings. I'm not saying don't go to church. Oh, please don't, don't get me wrong. But he did all of his teachings like a missionary. He went, he went to the people. They didn't go to church. They were sitting on the side of a hill talking and listening and worshiping and learning. Well, I'll, I'll agree with the second part of that. I won't agree with the first. Uh, they did go to church, and they also sat on the hillsides. Because we hear about him going from synagogue to synagogue, right? That was, that was their church. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, so I think, Ray, you're answering the question, is church attendance necessary? That's a different question, right? Okay. Um, right. Am I, can I be saved without stepping foot in a church building? Yes. Yeah, the Holy Spirit can work. You know, you think about the, the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip comes and he says, hey, why don't we get, you know, he's talking to him in a chariot and he says, here's water, let's, yeah. let's get baptized. Um, what, was he a believer? Absolutely. Um, even before he made it into a church, although you could make the argument, yeah, but he'd been going to the temple, so uh, he had been in church here in the Word, and now he now it just clicked that Jesus is the answer. But that's a that's a whole side sidebar there. Okay, this, um, is, this is my opinion. What's that? Um, I think I think it's probably not required, but I think it will build a healthier relationship. Okay, it builds a healthier relationship. So my. Um, my salvation is not based on how many times I've gone to church, right? It's not, if I do this, then I get that. But because of what God has done for me, um, and I want to keep growing, he says, this is how I can keep growing. That we need one another, you know, two or three gathering together in his name, there he is with us. Uh, we can encourage one another, we're growing in his word, we receive the sacraments. Um, so is it important? Absolutely. Uh, is it a checklist task box, you know, task, task box that I check the box and okay, I made it to church 42 times this year. So, so I'm good with God. Um, there's that, that old saying, you know, being in an airport doesn't make you an airplane, but if you're in an air, but if you're an airplane, you're going to find yourself in an airport. Being in church doesn't make you a Christian. So it's not by doing the deed. I, I'm, I've accomplished what I need to do. But if Pastor. I'm a Christian, I'm going to find myself in church. We're Pastor. going to want to be uh, growing in God's word. Yeah. Well, what would be the definition of church? Because not all churches have a solid building. That right? Is, that is such say. a great question, Carl. Yep. So the, the, yeah, that the, really is. And we answer, really use that shorthand yeah. a lot. Yeah, we, we use it as shorthand. And that's um, actually chapter five is all about the church. So you, you guys are just setting me up for these next lessons. Um, well, actually, I have another question for you. Okay. Because you mentioned earlier in this discussion that God chooses us. Mm -hmm. So my question is, so God chooses Kurt, but he doesn't choose Carl. What, but I thought God loved all men. So where, where are we at in that? Okay. Awesome. This is this is Sonny's question as well from before. Right. Um, that and I didn't see an answer. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't so, hear an answer oh, either. Right. Answer. So jump ahead with me to the last question on page 24. And I Do think we have time. This is a sure. big one. This is a big <laughs> one. But, but but we've we've set the table for it, so we really gotta hit it now. So take it to um, Esau. <laughs> so why do some believe and not others? Really, that, that's the question, right? You know, Why? My question was actually, you said God chooses people. Yeah, yeah. Like yep. you're choosing a baseball team. So uh, Kurt was chosen to play for the Braves. Hey, yep. Carl was, let me call you, you know, back. I'm in a Bible study. Yeah. So it'll be, let's see. It'll be over at eight. Actually, All right, you know what? I think we can do this on my. Uh, Oh, no one in my briefcase in the pocket where the computer goes there's a, a pen a silver pen you know to use on this thing so i'm gonna i'm gonna pull up the whiteboard here um you could also talk about jacob and esau 
And, yep. piggy, and piggybacking on and piggybacking on that, um, if if um if God chooses us, then where does our will, our free will come in? A so-called free will come in. Ah, okay. Did we talk about that one? Oh, last that week? is a great with the, point. With the with the free will. Um, <clears throat> so remember, I think we talked about this one a couple of weeks ago. The uh, um, you know Adam and Eve were created with the ability to sin. Or oh, the yeah, ability yeah, yeah, yeah. not to sin, right? Uh, but then once they sinned and we were born in sin, we lost our free will, right? Okay. So what are what are we by nature? Our only freedom is to rebel against God because we're dead, we're hostile, we think his word is foolish. You know all of those all of those things that we looked at. Um, so when we talk about someone coming to faith, all right? Can you guys see that up there? Yeah. So there's two kinds of people in the world, right? There's believers and unbelievers, right? Beautiful penmanship, huh? Wow, you need to get really clear of that. <laughs> okay. So, if someone believes, who gets the credit? God. God, God does, right? God's credit. Um, because we wouldn't be able to do it by ourselves. We were dead. We were fighting against him instead of coming toward him. You know, he takes our heart of stone and makes it a heart of flesh. Look at the passages on the bottom of page 24. 1 Timothy 2.4, God wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Ezekiel 33, God said, Say to them, As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? You know, what does he want? He wants them to stop rebelling against him. He wants them to be his. Okay, so it sounds like, it sounds like Sorry, Pastor, but it sounds like they, when we, we know scriptures, it sounds like they have a choice. Matthew 23. He, he, uh, he says, you know, this is Jesus talking about Jerusalem. He says, you kill the prophets, stone those sent you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. He wanted them to believe, and what were they choosing, Sonny? To, go, to not believe. They were choosing not to believe. That's the choice we have by nature, right? So notice it doesn't say it, 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 it doesn't say um, they were choosing to believe, they were choosing not to believe. So if someone doesn't believe, whose fault is it? There. Theirs, right? So, 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 so I remember now, I think I remember now. So when Christ came and died for our sins, then that's when we got our, our, our will back, our free will back to choose, correct or not? Nope, because even after Jesus died for our sins, we were still born in sin. And so we were dead. We were hostile. We thought his word is foolish. We were blind. We were only evil all the time. You know, all those things that the Bible says about us by nature before God changed our heart. Because it's hard for us to have this conversation, Sonny, because God has changed both of our hearts, right? Um, so we don't, we don't know, we don't remember what it was like not to know God, not to believe in him. Um, and so, but, and here again, we want to go by what does the Bible say? Not what makes sense or what I think, but what does the Bible say? And here's where it gets tough, because we don't always want to let God be God. We want to say, no, 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 God, this is how it should be, right? So you look at these two things that we've got on here. God gets the credit if someone believes, human fault for those who don't believe. But this is where um, I think Carl was coming at before. If God gets the credit for those who believe. You know, we were dead. He made us alive. We weren't able to do anything else. He had to do it. That must mean that he didn't want some, right? So he, he picked some to go to hell. Right. This teaching is called double predestination. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I will say it makes sense. Wow, well, you've got to get really better at that. <laughs> as long as I tell you what it says, you can see it, right? <laughs> it's not that funny. All right. <laughs> okay. So, but, but double predestination makes sense. If God gets the credit, well, then it only makes sense that he picked some. That means he picked others to go to hell. But God says, no, no, no. I want all to be saved. Right. So the Bible contradicts double predestination. But then some other people look at this and say, okay, the Bible is really clear. If someone doesn't believe, it's their fault. So that must mean 
that there's something different about those who believe. So in some way or another, maybe even just a little way, you know, I, I invited Jesus in. I chose him. I um, Human credit. This is called decision theology. Okay, but Pastor, at the beginning, you said Saul didn't believe. God went to him and made him believe. Absolutely. God gets the credit for that, right? Right, but he chose, he chose him to believe. Yes, that's what he said. Does, so how does, God, does, does God choose all believers in is, is I think, what Carl's asking. So, okay, so back down to this decision theology for a second. If this makes sense, too, and this is what we're wrestling with, I think, on both sides. So if it's true, because the Bible says it's true, that if someone doesn't believe, it's their fault, logically, what my mind says, it's got to be true that the human did something to call Jesus to him. The human did something to bring himself out of that death to life. But of course, the Bible says, no, 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 that doesn't work because we were dead. We were hostile. We could not do it. God had to do it. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So there's all sorts of passages that say, no, that doesn't work. So what we're left with here, the Bible says that if someone believes, God gets the credit. The Bible says that if someone doesn't believe, it's their fault. The Bible says that no one can come unless God calls him, unless God changes his heart. So, and so the bottom line then is that God chooses who's going to be saved. <clears throat> those who save, those who are saved, it's because God chose them. And okay. God, you know, in... Next time we'll open by looking at those passages on predestination. Uh, God, God called them with the gospel. God sanctified them with his truth. God uh, justified them, and he, he uh, um, glorifies them, giving them eternal life. Uh, but, then we can't, but then we can't get in that slippery slope that some churches believe. Once saved, always saved. So I can go out and do anything because I'm already predestined to go to heaven. You see what I mean? Well, yeah, that, that's why we want to go with what Scripture says. Right. Just because the church says once saved, always mm -hmm. saved. Um, the scripture doesn't say that. Scripture okay. gives those warnings not to, to turn away. And yet in, in election, in predestination, God gives the believer the promise uh, that, that he's been looking out for us from the beginning. Um, and then he says, now don't, don't turn away. So what we're coming to here, the Bible says stuff that does not make sense. But it does because... It gives God glory. Now, if God is God, and he is, I believe he is, if God is God, if God really made the world, which we have no problem saying, yeah, God created the world. We're going to look at that in Lesson 6. Um, if God is powerful enough to arrange things, you know, in Lesson 1, we talked about how he, he arranged so many things so that we all ended up here studying his word together. Uh, we've got no problem saying, yeah, God's that powerful. If God is really all powerful, then God gets the glory, Right? So anytime you're looking at a teaching and you're saying, okay, I don't get this. What's the right teaching? What's the right way to understand this? One of the tests you can give to it is the glory test. So in, in this here, someone believes it's because God chose him, God died for him, God caused him to believe, God gave him a new heart. Who gets the glory in that? God does. Um, but if we say, yeah, so then God wanted some not to be saved, that's taking glory away from God. So that doesn't work. Okay. If we say someone who doesn't believe it's because they rejected God, that, that doesn't take anything away from God. That's on them. But then if we say, well, the flip side of that is that we get the credit because we did something, well, that's taking glory away from God. Right, right. So the only thing that gives absolute glory to God is what the Bible says. Um, that if I believe, it's because God did it. If I don't, because rejected. And again, uh, Carl, I'm not saying that, that that makes sense to me. Right, but are we predestined or not? Are we, are we predestined by God or not? Okay, let's not forget. Let's not forget, please, if I may. God did not choose anybody to go to hell. Right. On 3.16, yep. he sent his son for all people. So he did not predestine anybody to hell. He sent them here for he sent him here for us for all people. If, if we don't get it, if we reject it, that's on us. 
Right. And, you know, to, to Sonny's question there, do we lose? Oh, there you are. Uh, you, you moved on my screen, Sonny. I, I lost you there for a second. Um, the, it, it is a hard thing to get through our minds. Uh, and actually, I'll, I'll be honest, the teaching of predestination uh, is the one that, especially in college, I struggled with more than, than any other. Uh, because it does not make sense. And my mind likes to have things make sense. I like to say, I get this, right? I, I'm a math mind. I, I like one plus one plus one is, is three. You know, I, I, I like that stuff. Um, and so with predestination, my mind says, that eh, it doesn't work. Uh, it's one or the other. And God says, no, 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 I'm bigger than your mind. Um, and I'll, I'll just tell you, I was uh, wrestling with this one time and I'm talking to a, uh, one of the RAs at, at my school. Um, and we were talking about this, and he said, John, go and look up every passage in the Bible that mentions predestination or election, and ask yourself two questions about them. Who's, who is God talking to in that passage, and why? What's the, what's the purpose? Every time it's talking to believers to give them comfort. He doesn't ask us to figure out his mind on why some are saved and not others, or why this person didn't believe and that person did that that's a God thing I'm not that's above my pay grade he wants to tell me I loved you so much that before you were even born I chose you and then when you were born I made sure that you heard the word and, and I called you to faith and I changed your heart and I, I I gave you the certainty of eternal life that's what God wants me to hear he doesn't want me to to have to try to figure out I, I'm not equipped to be God and to say this person's going to heaven and that person's not that that's beyond me and so it's a matter of, I'm going to let God be God here. He says that whoever believes, it's because he changed their heart. And whoever doesn't believe, it's because they rejected him. In other uh, words, we didn't, we didn't, I'm sorry. Our, our, our free will really doesn't have anything to do with us coming to faith then, correct? Yeah, because we don't have it. We don't have free will until God changes our heart. Okay. okay. By, by nature, we're dead. You know, what, what uh, ability does a dead person have to do anything? None, right? Um, by nature, we're hostile to God. So our only thing would be to fight against him, not to come toward right, him. Right, right. So God changes my heart, and then he gives me free will. Then, he gives it, then, then after we have free will, then that gives us the free will to reject him if we want to, correct? Well, we've always got that. We've always got the, the ability to reject him. Okay. The free will comes when we have a choice. Uh, and I don't have a choice until after he's changed my heart. And then I have a choice every day. Am I going to do what God wants me to do that's going to grow me closer to him? Or am I going to rebel against him and do what the world wants me to do or my sinful nature wants me to do uh, that's going to harm my relationship with him? Okay. And it's made up you know, of a thousand of those little choices because the more I do one thing, the further I get towards that side. Um, you know, I had a... I was at a youth rally one time, and, and the presenter uh, had a big roll of duct tape on the stage, and he, he was talking about uh, um, some of the huge challenges God puts in our lives. Um, you know, for maybe you talk about dealing with the death of the person you love most. Um, how am I ever going to be able to do that? Uh, now, if I, and he says, if I'm on this side of the stage and I've got to take a step to be okay with this person dying, um, or whatever it is, maybe, maybe dealing with cancer for myself or, you know, whatever this huge thing is. Uh, if, if, I, uh, if I'm going to get there, it doesn't happen in one giant leap. I don't have the ability to make that, that huge leap. But what God does is he gives me little tests along the way where, uh, okay, I've got to decide, am I going to pray to God today or am I going to get too busy and do something else? If I, if I pray to God today, well, I'm a little bit closer to him and I'm a little bit closer to understanding his will for my life. If I say, no, I'm going to take a step the other direction, uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to prioritize other things, and I keep going that direction, it just makes the leap to having to deal with this that much further. But our Christian life is a sanctification. It's, it's a, a growing in the ability to do those good things by practice. Uh, and, and each time, we're a little bit stronger and a little bit closer to handling whatever the big thing is. Does that make sense? No. No, sir. No, it doesn't. Pastor, when you talk about predestination, I'd like to go back to the Ephesians 2, verse 10. 
um, created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So before we were born, he's got stuff for us to do. And he's sure. already got it planned out. Yeah. Yep. And when we try to understand that, we try to put God into a human shaped box. Right. And it just doesn't work. Right. Um, so all we can do is say, okay, God, you're God. And if you're God, you're right. So let's listen to what you say. And he is very clear. We can't come to him on our own. He's got to do that. And he's very clear that uh, if someone doesn't believe, it's because they're rejecting him. Again, I don't get how that works, but that's above my pay grade. Uh, God's told me this is what it is. And so I'll say, yep, this is true and this is true, even though mine says, well, I can't be both. It is. Um, and, you know, I think of in, in non-theological things, there have been plenty of times when I've looked at something and said, well, I know this is true, and someone else says this is true, and I say, well, it can't be both, and somehow it is. You know, you, you, you learn a little bit more about it, and you understand the complexities a little bit more, and oh, yeah, uh, both of those things were true, and they didn't look like they could coexist. Uh, this is just so much more because now we're talking about God. Uh, he said it, so let's go with that. Um, we are the other thing, the other thing I wanted to add to that um, was – we, we never know how God is going to put somebody or something in front of us. So we have to keep our eyes wide open every minute of every day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's got, he's got plans for us. And even uh, if God, even if God knows, like, you know, we think that God knows, or are we, I, I'm kind of getting it, that, that, that God already predest, you know, predestined us, but we don't know what predestined. So we have to take it as, we stay in the faith and keep growing in the faith to, to, to reach uh, heaven. Right or not? Well, he, he, yeah, he does encourage us to, to stay in his word. And, and you know, the, the more we study and see how much he has done and is doing and will do for us, the more we want to be close to him. Uh, so it, it's all this beautiful cycle. And, and I apologize. I've gone way over on this, but, uh, um, next week we'll start with uh, wrapping up some of this. Uh, so write down your questions, email them to me. And actually, actually next week I'm on vacation, so it's Vicar. So we're going to stick it to him, give him some tough questions. Um, <laughs> That's and, wrong. Yeah, uh, he does. So and, and, uh, and I'm going to watch the recording and, and laugh. Uh, so. <laughs> and actually, we don't care about going over. Thank well, you for I staying. Don't care about going over, Kurt. I don't care about going over. Good, good. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Let's close with prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us enough to, to make us yours. We were headed to hell, but, but you changed our heart. You, you gave us faith in the work that Jesus has already completed. Uh, keep us in that faith. Help us to fight against the temptations. Help us to... Uh, uh, Take all those little steps that, that the Holy Spirit strengthens us to take. Uh, let us look to your word every day. Uh, let us gather together again each of these lessons and, and in worship on Sunday and, and all the opportunities you give us so that we keep growing closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Sharp. Goodbye. Yes. Uh, I'm going to tell, tell Pastor Patterson about the... Uh, that's all heavy, heavy Hold up, I'm, Sonny, say that again. I, I didn't hear you. I said I'm going to tell Pastor Patterson about the idea that y'all do during the summer about having Bible studies in the church. Uh, I think it's a great idea. Sonny, you're really quiet. And I don't know what. Can you say that again? Let's see. Oh, I said I'm going to tell Pastor uh, Patterson, our pastor. About the idea that y'all do during the summer about having Bible study during church, I think that's a great idea. Okay, cool. Yeah, I love that. Well, good. I, I watch I watch y'all every Sunday, so. Awesome, awesome. We'll see you Sunday. Okay, or Wednesday, Wednesday. Yes. Yeah, I'll actually I'll be. Oh no, yeah, I'll be here. I'll be here Wednesday. Yep, I leave on Friday. Well, have a good vacation if I don't see you again. All right. Thanks, Sonny. Bye. Bye-bye.